So I've been blessed to spend more than half of my life cutting gemstones. And in this talk today, one of the things I would like to talk about is how gems are cut. I imagine that the range of experience of people watching varies widely. So to some people, this will be old news. And to some people, it will be new news. But bear with me, because we're going to talk about not only that, not only how crystals such as these become fasted gems, like the ones below, but also we are going to be talking about cutting quality, gemstone optics, cutting theory, and obviously we'll be not covering in depth many of these subjects or otherwise this would be days worth of talks and you probably don't have time for that. But I also want to touch on cutting styles because there are many, this is a question I get a lot at shows is what are the pros and cons of each different cutting style? And I, I feel that all of these questions have given me the opportunity to think about the subject and explain them. Um, but first off, <clears throat> excuse me. First off, I'd like to start with a story because everybody likes a story. And this is the story of this Imperial Topaz crystal. Now, Imperial Topaz is mined in Brazil, and it's a relatively sought after gem. And recently, the mining situation has been very difficult, and so it's gotten very, very expensive. This particular crystal I paid 10 grand for, just as an example. Um, and that was a somewhat risky purchase. We hoped to get a 13 carat stone out of it or 13 carats worth of stone. But this is what happens when we buy rough is we try to examine what is inside the crystal with a light, careful examination. And then after we buy it, of course, we have to start dismantling it or have to start removing everything that's junk. This is after one of the first stages of grinding. All of those shiny things that you see inside the crystal are cracks. So this first step is after removing a lot of the cracks from the crystal. The black lines you see are Sharpie. We use a black Sharpie to draw on the crystal. And this is a very expensive crystal. So my father and I were consulting with each other on it, going back and forth about what would be the best idea. Those first Sharpie marks were not acted on. We didn't like that idea. So there were still some additional inclusions and we ground off more. You can see that it, it got smaller yet. Um, I don't know, can you see the mouse where I, when I move the mouse or is that not visible? Yes, you can see it. Okay, so this line here is a crack in the gemstone that was still there, which stopped right here. So we decided to saw it across at this point. Even though we were like the only ones who did. <laughs> okay. So we sawed it across at these, this point and got two stones so far. Something interesting about Imperial Topaz, as another lesson we learned, is that Imperial Topaz has a basal cleavage plane. This little flat on the end of the crystal is the, a cleavage plane. And that cleavage plane is in the same direction from the very base to the very tip of the crystal. And one of the first Imperial Topaz crystals we bought, fortunately it was a lighter color one and when it, they were more affordable, we wanted to saw in this direction. So we always had seen the Brazilians, they would saw around the skin and then take a knife or a screwdriver and stick it in there and twist and crack it the rest of the way across. 
and we thought they're just being cheap on saw blades. They're not wanting to spend the money on saw blades, but we don't care if it's a $20 saw blade, we'll saw all the way across. And so we sawed all the way across the crystal and had stress fractures run up in the same direction where this fracture is here. And what we had hoped to be about a 20 carat stone ended up being four or five three carat stones. So that was an expensive learning experience. But by the time we got to this crystal, we'd had many years of cutting and knew what to be doing. So we just sawed around the very edge and the rest we cracked just like the Brazilians do across and used the cleavage plane, we cleaved it. This part is preformed into a sort of a cushion shape. And here is the same piece with some finger oil on it to make it a little easier to see in with a black line drawn where we planned to saw it. And we sawed it and preformed it into three different stones. This was one stone, this was another stone, and here's the first one. We got 16.27 carats total weight of preforms, of which usually I would get somewhere around 10 carats out of that, maybe 11. So after that, <clears throat> we glued it to the dop, and the dop is a cylinder and started cutting, but something bad happened. See this little white spot here? I don't know if everybody has a big enough screen to see that, but there's a little white section in the crystal, this crack started to run into the imperial topaz. And I tried, sometimes sawing causes less cracking than cutting. I tried to get it out with a saw blade that didn't work. I chased it <clears throat> with the finest grit cutting wheels I could. I used every trick in the book that I knew of. Unfortunately, the crack kept on running. And so out of that crystal, which I hoped to get 10 to 13 carats out of, I ended up with one stone of a carat 22. If any of you know about Imperial Topaz, which I'm sure many of you do, you know that a carat 22 Imperial Topaz is not going to recoup me my investment. Yep. So this is after everybody said how great I am, <laughs> I still have problems. Um, but this is the risk of buying rough and the challenge, part of the challenge too. And this sort of gives you a quick overview of how gems are cut. Um, but <clears throat> I'm gonna show it a little bit more visually here. Uh, in a short video, um, which take you th through each step. And this is me cutting in the video and I use an Ultratech fasting machine, which is my favorite brand of fasting machine. So the first step is examining the rough and drawing lines like you saw in the Imperial Topaz to decide where to saw. I use a respirator when I'm grinding and sawing in the first steps because that's when the most dust is generated. And if you generate a lot of dust, there is some risk of silicosis. Also, you have to be really careful because this is like a mini table saw. If you, well, you can get a dandy cut on your finger if you get into that blade. Then the gem is preformed. So that is the rough shaping. That's all done freehand. Excuse all the gem dust on my cabbing machine there. Um, somebody saw this video, another cutter, and said, you should have cleaned that off for the video. But then they're glued on the dops like this. And then the dop is inserted into a fasting machine. And this is an American style fasting machine. It's an Ultratech. It's, as I said, it's my favorite machine to use. And the Ultratech and all American style fasting machines allows for price control, precise control of the rotation and the angle used 
And then I'm sure that many of you gemstone experts and GGs and things know this, but gemstones are actually ground rather than cut. You know, we talk about cutting a gemstone, but they're actually ground. This spinning disc is called a lap, which has diamond powder in it. And that abrades the gemstone. It grinds sort of like sandpaper wood or a grinding wheel wood. And of course, the grit chosen and the material of the lap is chosen strategically to achieve the speed of grinding that you want. And each facet is cut individually at a specific angle and at a specific rotation. Now, this is a quick, this is a polishing lap. Um, and this is a quick overview of how polishing works. If you can see the table of this amethyst, it's sort of frosted looking. You'll see a little bit better in a second here. But polishing, every facet has to be revisited multiple times. So it's not just cut it or grind it and you're done. You have to grind it. Sometimes you have to pre-polish it and then you have to polish it. So this is the polishing step. And then after you've cut the one side because it's glued on to the dop, you have to glue it on to the other side. So this is the transferring process. At least it's how I do it. And I'm adhering uh, dop wax to the other side of the gem. And then I push the two sides together. And then I remove the initial dop. And this allows me to cut the top or the crown of the gem. So if you already know all of this, sorry for taking your time with it, but I find that a lot of people have no concept of how gems are actually cut. Mm -hmm. And this is useful to them. And then the gem is taken off. And this is, to me, one of the most fun parts because I get to see the results. Even though I've done this a lot, it's always a little bit of a surprise. It's like Christmas, opening a present and seeing what the gem looks like when I'm done. And that's <laughs> part of the fun part.